excited to have you all here today in the house of the Lord. We're just uh, delighted for, for all of our guests to come and celebrate the love of God with us. Amen. I want to say that it's always a pleasure to look out among an assembled audience such as this, see those who just by the very smile on your face. It's an example or it's an indication that you've been blessed. Amen. When we are blessed, we acknowledge the blessor. So we're here today to render up to God expressions of thanksgiving. We marvel not only over the divine creation and all that God has made and what God has done, but because He is God. Amen. He's God all by Himself. Right. He is the one who controls the very universe. Right. He's the creator and sustainer of this very world. And, and what amazes me today is the fact that in the midst of his divine greatness, right. he is careful to consider every right. hair on my head. Amen. And you know, that's really what's amazing about this thing. But we know that God is good and he's good all the time and we know that he does marvelous things. But when I look at my life, and when you look at your life, even through all the missteps, the mistakes, uh, the uh, unfulfilled dreams, the unmet expectations, unkept promises, even in spite of all that, God is still good. God still loves us, even uh, in spite of ourselves. You see, He does not love us because we're so lovable. He doesn't love us because of us. He loves us in spite of us. In spite of the fact that we've Sin and falling short of the glory of God. If you don't believe me about his love, just look to the cross. And you will see unquestionable evidence of God's love. And so on last, Lord, that we embarked upon a series, a series of studies that will help us to understand the full import of God's love and, and also his expectations of his people. And we have entitled this new series, The Purpose and Product of Life in Christ. The Purpose and the Product of Life in Christ. But we know that the purpose of life in Christ is simply fellowship with God, communion with God. Understand that, you know, God, number one, let me just give this disclaimer, God does not need us to have fellowship. God has fellowship within himself. You see, God created and, and, and so designed us uh, to be recipients of his love and to have the capacity and even the longing for fellowship. But you see, there was a time when the fellowship that was uh, prevalent with God and man in the garden was disrupted. And it was disrupted by sin. But that didn't mean that God stopped loving you. No, he made provisions for us, even in our shortcomings. And so therefore, it's not having your name on the church roll that guarantees fellowship with God. You see, fellowship with God, that's the most important thing in your life. More important than being a member of the church, because you're a member of the church so that you can have fellowship with God. More important than forgiveness of sin. See, forgiveness of sin is not the end in and of itself. It is a means to an end. Your forgiveness is so that you can have a restoration of what? Your fellowship with God. And so therefore the purpose of life in Christ is communion of fellowship with God. And therefore the product, the product of your life is glory to God. For Jesus said that if I be lifted up, in other words, as we, the body of Christ, as we exalt the character of Christ in our living, we bring glory to God. Amen. And so therefore, I want you to turn your Bible today to the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. And we're going to talk about a passage that's very, very familiar to many of us. It's been traditionally labeled the parable of the soul. The parable of the sower. And it is so labeled because the Bible says that a sower went out to sow seed. 
and this sower, he sowed seed. And while the sower must strive to properly sow seed, understand that when Jesus is giving this parable, the sower is none other than Christ himself. But not only is the sower Christ, but all of those who would preach and teach and proclaim his message to the masses. The sower uh, must strive, therefore, to preach the whole counsel of God without addition or subtraction. And yes, uh, there's another element to this parable because the sower went out to sow seed, which helps us to understand that the seed that is sown must be pure seed. The Bible says that the seed is the word of God. We have been redeemed not by perishable things such as silver and gold. No, but it's the blood of Jesus, right? Yeah. But the seed, the seed uh, of the kingdom is the word of God. We've been born not by a corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed. The word of God is able to produce life, spiritual life, leads to eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now, while the sower must strive to sow, and the seed or the message must be the incorruptible word of God, this parable, this parable places emphasis not on the sower. It places emphasis not on the seed. This parable places the emphasis on the soil. So I want to use that as a topic today, the parable of the soils. The parable of the soils. You see, as it places emphasis on the hearer, the hearer of the word is what's important. The word can go out, but the question is, uh, how do you hear? And then after hearing, how do you respond to what you hear? Somebody said one time that we are not be we are hearers of the word, but we ought to be doers of the word. In other words, what impression does the word of God make on your life? You see, this soil is representative of the heart of man. And all of you represent one of four kind of hearts, one of four kind of soils. And I hope and pray that as we go through this message, uh, that we take the necessary precautions to avoiding being one of the wrong kind of souls. And be diligent to pursue the examples of good soil. In other words, how's your heart today? How's your heart? Do you have a heart uh, that is receptive to the Word of God? Or do you have a heart? Uh, that is cold and callous toward the Word of God. And after all is said and done, after we leave here today, I hope that we live fruitful lives. How many of us want to live a fruitful life? Yeah. A life that is full of meaning and significance. A life that is productive, such to the fact that those around you will reap the benefits of a life well lived. Amen. That has to be the overall objective. So the theme, theme of this message is, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. Because you are responsible for your heart. You are responsible for the type of soil that receives the seed, which is the word of God. Notice, to get some kind of contextual setting as we move into this our message today, we won't be very long. I know you guys, uh, <laughs> it's not going to let me be a husband. <laughs> Amen. Some of y'all ready for the invitation already. <laughs> but notice in chapter 12, we see Jesus, Jesus coming into a certain synagogue on the Sabbath day. And there's a man who has a hand who's withered, that is withered. And he restores that man's hand. 
And everyone should have shouted for joy because of the healing that he brought to this man. But you see, he healed him on the Sabbath day. And see, it's amazing. I don't know about you, but every time you want to do something good, there are those who receive that good and rejoice. But on the other hand, there's always some critic somewhere I see out there now. There's a critic out there who's always looking to find fault in somebody or something. Jesus performed a miracle and healed the man's hand. And then there were those who said, well, I should have did it on Saturday. He had every other day of the week. Why did he do that? The Bible also talks about, in, in, in chapter 12, in verse number 22, uh, that there was a man who was demon-possessed. Demon-possessed. And Jesus cast the evil spirit out of him. And then instead of rejoicing and praising God, there were those that, well, he did that by the, by the, by the spirit of the devil. By Beelzebub. The prince of the demons. Even his good works were evil spoken of. Because of the hearts of those who, who beheld that, that phenomenon, that spectacle. They couldn't give glory to God. They began to criticize. That's when Jesus had a house divided against itself. Can I say it? That's right. That's right. That's a whole lot of implications we're going to talk about today. Amen. My own houses can't stand because we're not, we're not united as a family. Right. But notice as we move forward, we find that a great controversy arose. Later on in the same chapter, there are many of the Pharisees begin to say, well, show us a sign. You know, they were going to believe anyway. Show us another parlor trick. Do some kind of, some feat. Because their hearts were not really receptive. And then, after they pressed him for a sign, the Bible says he was teaching and he, he, his own family came looking for him. You see, when Jesus was out there preaching, talking about he died. <laughs> that was causing some embarrassment even to the family. See, sometimes we do certain things and make the family member the shame. Come on now. <laughs> <clears throat> I say all that to say this. There were mixed feelings. There was a swirl of controversy. As to the person and purpose, even the power of Jesus. And it was in that context that the Bible says that the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside. And the Bible says the great multitude were gathered together. They weren't at the temple. <coughs> they weren't in the synagogue. He was by the seaside. Great multitudes came to him. The Bible said he began to teach them. And he began to help them to understand the different kind of hearts that are in this world. And I'm just praying to God within myself right now. This audience represents different kinds of soil. Different kinds of hearts. I I'm not God. I, don't, I can't discern your heart. But God can. And the beautiful thing about soil, it does not matter how hard or unworkable the soil is with the proper care and attention. The soil's condition can improve. So all of us in here, I don't care how wicked you are, how callous you are, God's word is able to move in your life. God is able to give you the grace that you need, the, the, the cultivating grace. Yeah. Through his loving kindness and through the kindness of others, he can begin to soften your heart. Amen. And I pray that that's what happens today. Amen. Notice quickly, as we go into this lesson, as I said, uh, I won't be long, and your know, time is a relative thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Notice in the text, he begins by saying, I think I want to start in verse number three. And he spake these things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed some seed, fell by the wayside. 
You see, there are four seeds. There are the, there are the four soils. One is categorized by the wayside. The other is characterized by rocky soil. And then the other, stony ground. And then the other, good soil. Notice when I said that, I made sure I didn't look at anybody. <laughs> I, I turned it over here. The president is trying to call me bad seed now. <laughs> Not going there. But some fell by the wayside. What about the wayside soil? What is the description of the wayside soil? Uh, it is impervious to spiritual impressions. Uh, it is indifferent as a hearer. The one who hears uh, with a wandering mind and who goes away untouched and unmoved. You can hear sermon after sermon after sermon, yet be unmoved, untouched. Why? Because of the, the condition of the soil. Let's examine the soil for just a moment. It's hard. It's hard. It is the soil at the end of the road. When you're, when you're going down, you roll a uh, hole, hold the road, right? Is it hold the road? Whatever. Right? When you're plowing, you hold, <laughs> you roll, you're going to plant. Okay. <laughs> but at the end of that road, where, the, where even the, the soil of the seed has trampled it, and, and, and people have traveled, and they'll walk down a, a street or in the grass, and people walk that past over, their grass won't grow there anymore. Right, right. You live in the projects, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Them paths, you know, people just keep on walking, walking in your grass, until the point where the grass won't even grow there no more. It gets hard, and, and, and nothing will penetrate. Right. That is the condition of this soil. That's the condition of many people's hearts. You know, through whatever situation in life, we allow ourselves to become hard, callous, impervious to the seed. Nothing can penetrate. Right. Attitudes and dispositions are such that I can't be receptive to the engrafted word, even though I know it's able to save my soul. Hard, in the road. It's kind of like, if I can illustrate, remember when Moses was commissioned to go back to Egypt to liberate the people. And he said to Pharaoh, God said for me to tell you, let my people go. The Bible says that Pharaoh's heart was hard. His heart was so hard that he said, I'm not letting them go. And then he got into a, a, a tug of war, a tennis match, a, 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 just a battle with God. It was a boxing match, nine, ten rounds called Ten Plagues, that God had to show Pharaoh that God was Jehovah God. He was the God of all. At the end of that, and he got TKO in the tenth round. Oh, yes, he did. He let him know. But then the Bible says that God hardened his heart. I always was baffled. Why would God harden a heart? Have you ever thought about that? Why would God harden a heart? See, the word of God will either draw you or drag you, depending on your heart. If I want to go outside in the midst of the summer heat, and I take some wet uh, clay, and I set it out there on the street, and also I have a hard, cold stick of butter, and I set it out there in the street, at the time, the, the heat and the rain of the sun will have an impact on those two substances. The butter will melt while the clay will dry up and get hard as a rock. Same sun, same heat, different elements. In the heart of man, the word of God, sometimes it can come down on us and it begins to soften our heart. It begins to cause us to have a proclivity or a leaning toward the things of God. But another heart can hear the same word, the same message, and become indifferent, become very callous, cold. See, the way God hardened his heart was to give him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. See, sometimes you get so many opportunities 
And the more you pass up an opportunity, the more insensitive your heart becomes. You can hear it and it'll move you, but then you don't respond to it. But then you hear it again and it moves you just a little bit less than it did before. And then after time, after time, you can hear a good old message, a good sermon, a good a word of God, and be just indifferent. Unmoved, untouched, and unchanged. Now, the consistent refusal to heed the gospel message is a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. Oh, yes, it is. You have to make sure. See, that's why the Bible said, uh, when you hear my voice, hard not to heart. Receive the engrafted word while you have life in your body. Because you don't know this may be the last time that you have an opportunity to receive the word. Now, why? Why then would a heart become hard? Why would one be so indifferent to the word of God? Well, there are a lot of things. Life itself. See, sometimes when you get dogged, used and abused, taken advantage of, you know, uh, we lose our inner sense, don't we? And then, you know, those old golden rules do unto others that you were held, they do unto you. We begin to turn it on the upside of the record. Do unto others before they do unto you. <laughs> oh, yes. And so, uh, the Bible talks about we ought to encourage one another. So that we don't succumb to the deceitfulness, the deceitfulness of sin. You see, we can get caught in a sin-filled world, living a sin-filled life, and we begin to have a love affair with the things that satisfy the desire of the flesh. And when you get so caught up in, you know, the, the worldly activity, you know, seeking after the brass ring that the world has to offer, then the more you move toward the world's values and standards and mores and norms and customs, the less you are able to hear and receive the kingdom's ethic, the kingdom's standards. And so therefore, we can find ourselves drifting further and further away, where it becomes very virtually impossible to bring you back. So you see, let me introduce another character in this scenario. Because Satan, Satan knows the power of the Word of God. Oh, yes, he does. See, the one who has a hard heart, the one who has a hard heart, he hears but lacks comprehension or understanding of the Word's power. He also uh, underestimates Satan's desire to take the Word away. So therefore, when the word falls on that hard heart, that hard soil, and you're indifferent, and you don't receive it, uh, Satan, notice the barriers of the air come out, right? The Satan comes, and he snatches it away. Amen. He snatches it away before they will take root and bring forth fruit. That is the wayside soil. So beware of the sin of procrastination. When you hear the word of God and it begins to move a little bit in you, and we, we don't want to be embarrassed by coming up. You know, like, like people look at me. They're going to begin to say, well, what did he do last night? He had to come up here. You talk about, I want to be baptized. I want to have my sins washed away. There are those who don't want to see that. That's right. Satan does not want to see that. That's right. He's going to do everything. He's going to play games. Like, don't go up there. They just want your money. I've heard a few things about reputation about preachers. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Ah, Satan will put all kinds of stuff in your mind to help the moment pass away with an unresponding behavior on your part. Beware of the sin of procrastination and the sin of underestimation. Don't underestimate the fact that Satan wants to snatch it away. Oh, yes, he does. Let us do what we know to do today. Let our hearts become hardened and the words have little or no impression on our lives. That is the predicament of the soil that is turned by the wayside. And then notice, back in our text, he begins to talk about another kind of soil. He says, some... Uh, verse 5, some fell upon 
stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up. And because they had no deepness of earth, and when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. There are certain people's hearts um, that are rocky soil. In other words, this is the hero who is impossible, impossibly, impossibly receptive. They hear it, oh wow, on an impulse. They receive it with gladness. Oh, hallelujah, praise God. That was a great message, and I want to respond to it. I love that kind of person. I really do. However, as they are receptive to the gospel, it is a superficial receptivity. They are superficially touched. Notice the, the, the earth, the ground was thin. The layer was thin. And they were superficial in their receptivity. Uh, they were touched, uh, but as quick and as suddenly as they were touched, that's how quick and how suddenly they can fall away. Amen. They quit just as quickly as they start. If, 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 if emotions and superficiality is what got them there, emotions and superficiality will send them packing. Notice, let's examine it quickly. This, this soil is a thin layer of soil over a bed rock. Okay, that's why I say on rocky places. It sprang up quickly, but with no deepness of earth, it withered. In other words, uh, they did not do what Jesus told us to do in the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. See, in the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, Jesus says, if you're going to come to me, if you want to be my disciple, you must first count the cost. Understand what it means to be a Christian. Understand what it means to be, to give your life to Christ. It's not a skipping down the yellow road of the only way to heaven. Because you make a decision to give your life to Christ, don't think that everything will be easy. Everything will be now pieces and cream. No, you, sometimes the heat gets turned up when you give your life to Christ. See, this this person said, Jesus said, one man who, if he wants to build a tower, does he not first sit down and calculate the cost yeah. to see whether or not he has enough to complete the project? Whether, or he, if he doesn't, he may find himself in the middle of the project, finding himself not having the resources necessary to complete it. Right. And then he becomes a laughing stock. Right. Amongst the people. Right. <laughs> he began to be able, he wasn't able to complete it. <laughs> See, when you give your life to Christ on a whim, and you get halfway through the journey, or you get your feet wet in the journey, and then you pull out and go on about your business, you see that causes unbelievers to ridicule the church. That's right. uh, that causes others to begin to question your sincerity. Do you really love God or not? The problem with this, you can look on every church road in this country. Look on the church road and you'll see names of individuals who are on the road, but are MIA, right. missing in action. Right. You'll find their names are still on the road, but they are now POW, right. prisoners of war. You find people whose name is still on the road, but you can't find them. And so, what I'm trying to say is, is this kind of superficial attachment, you may hear the word and make an impulsive decision, but then you don't have enough to see it through. These kind of individuals, they only see the, the, the gospel, on the, they only want to walk on the, on the sunny side of the street. Because Jesus, when he gives the invitation, he says you'll find rest. Right? Eternal life. Salvation, communion with God, you know, forgiveness of sins. All of those things are beautiful. And, and we, 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 it, it draws us. We want that. We need that. But there's another side of the gospel. There's another side of the gospel. For the Bible says that it's been granted to us not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His name. When you stand up for God, 
There'll be those you are now standing against. Folks who you usually uh, had a good time with. But now when you begin to plant your, your banner in the sand and say, I'm on God's side, by virtue of making that declaration, you've always already made yourself an enemy. Yeah. An enemy mm -hmm. to a lot of folks who used to be friends with. Yeah. Right. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come uh, to bring peace but a soul. Because every man's household will be divided against itself. Mother against father and brother against sister. On and on and on. Why? Because the gospel. The good news of Jesus. The kingdom standard will make you make a decision as to what side you want. And so just because we give our lives to Christ, that doesn't mean that everything is going to work out fine as we try to matriculate through the society. There's going to be a lot of pressure, persecution, suffering, and many, you only see the gospel from a vantage point of peaches and cream and, and roses and blue skies and all that kind of stuff. You can become despondent and despairing and fall away. Amen. So therefore, those elements of Christianity, they ignore the trials and tribulations. And notice, he said, when the sun comes out. When the sun comes out. Now, most plants need sun, right? Yeah. Isn't it amazing that when you don't have the depth of earth, when you're not rooted and grounded, the very thing that's supposed to bring you life brings you death. Amen. The very thing that is supposed to help you is the thing that destroys you. See, see, in, 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 in a perfect scenario, you have soil that is rich and is deep enough so that the root system can run deep and get all the nourishment. But if there's a shallow root system, that sun comes out and it will burn that plant up. The water that gives life to a plant is the very thing that will wash it away if the roots are not deep enough. See, this soil is among the rocky ground. In other words, it did not have depth of earth, and there was nowhere for the root system to go. Consequently, consequently, when times got hard, and when the going got tough, they withered away. What kind of soil do you have today? Life circumstances will challenge your faith in Christ. We may say today, oh, how I love Jesus. It's a beautiful song, but can you live it? When the times get rough and the going gets tough, do you still cling to the old rugged cross? You see, we find life circumstances uh, challenging us in things that are real, things that are perceived. You see, sometimes we have some legitimate gripes and concerns. Sometimes we perceive things to be a certain way that they really aren't. But sometimes we just manufacture some stuff. Sometimes we just make some stuff up. We manufacture problems. This brother didn't shake my hand. Didn't speak to me. You know, I, I don't agree with that. You can walk through <laughs> you can walk through a crowded room and you can be shaking everybody's hand. There can be somebody standing over you like this. That's true. Waiting. <laughs> Waiting for you to miss that hand. They're not going to shake your hand. <laughs> They're waiting. Let me leave it on. <laughs> but I'm just saying, when we are superficial, when we don't have depth of earth, when there's nothing uh, for a root system to take hold of, any and every breeze will blow you away. You see, that can also be doctrinal unsoundness. The Bible says not to be tossed to and fro on every wind of doctrine. That represents an immature person. God wants us to be mature. That no uh, uh, circumstance, no foreign teaching can just wash you away. Isn't it amazing how uh, the Apostle Paul says to the Galatians, he says, I marvel. He says, I marvel at you. That you're so soon removed to another gospel. So soon we move to another gospel. In other words, we need to make sure that we're rooted and grounded in the things that matter. You see, this kind of uh, soil produces immediate life, but it also produces momentary life. It sprung up quickly, but just as quickly as it sprung up, it withered away. 
When you come on a emotional whim and that's all you got, your time may be very momentarily. So we must be rooted and grounded in God's love. We must be rooted and grounded in God's word. We must be rooted and grounded in God's son. So Jesus does not condemn those who respond quickly. No, he doesn't. As a matter of fact, let me just set the record straight. Uh, some of us have, I want to give my life to Christ, but Brother Merriman said not to respond quickly. No, they said. Jesus never condemns those who respond quickly. On that, in Acts chapter 2, when the multitude heard the word from the very first time, 3,000 souls responded. In Acts chapter 8, when the, the eunuch from Ethiopia, when he heard the message, he didn't, he didn't have sermon after sermon after sermon. He responded immediately. Jesus never had a problem with those who respond immediately. No, no, no. His problem was that those who were quick to respond were just as quick to stop. Come on. But there's another kind of sorrow. There's a sorrow that fell, the seeds fell among thorns. Now, this kind of soil, notice, is not too hard. The word can penetrate it. It's not too thin. There is depth of earth. I think that's important. Uh, it's not too hard. It's not too thin. It's just too crowded. All right. It's just too crowded. All right. Notice, it says that this, this soil was perfect for planting. But the only problem was too much other stuff. All right. How many of you got more stuff on your plate than you can handle. Right. Sometimes we get so much stuff that crowds our allegiance and challenges our allegiance. And we can't give proper allegiance to Christ because we got so many other things that we have to attend to. You see, the Bible tells us that you cannot contain wheat and thorns at the same time. Let's look at this. See, this, this helps us understand a double-minded person. But Jesus said you can't serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. Why? Because he's going to hate one and love the other. He's going to cling to one and despise the other. You can't serve man or you can't serve God and materialism all at the same time. There's going to be a conflict. There's going to be a tug of war. There's going to be a dividing of allegiances there. And so there we go. We can't be double-minded. Some people come in the church with mixed motives with mixed motives, preoccupations, hidden agendas. I don't know who you are today, but God knows your heart. There are a time when uh, the test of time will, will, will challenge and expose who we really are. Notice, what are the thorns? In this sense, what are the thorns? Well, whatever chokes the good seed out of you is the thorn. <laughs> whatever chokes the word out of you See, I can't say, here, exhibit A, this is a thorn. No. It doesn't work like that. Because a thorn for me not, may not be a thorn for you. Right. Whatever it is in your life that chokes the word out, whatever it is in your life that, that you become so preoccupied with, that it begins to rob, rob God of his hand, Amen. of his allegiance. Amen. That's a thorn. And the thorn can, can, choke, can choke the word out right. of your heart. Right. And so therefore we need to understand just how subtle this thing can be. Because thorns can be things that are legitimate as well as illegitimate. Oops. Oh yes. Oh yes. You love your family. Don't you? That was supposed to be me. Yeah, I do love your family. We love our families. But you see, we can get so caught up in family that we ask God out of the picture. We, we, we need, we need recreation. We need to recreate ourselves. That's recreation because of recreation, okay? Through relaxation and recreation, you recreate yourself and get yourself, and when you go on vacation, you're supposed to come back more energized, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> recreation, you know, employment that is meaningful and fulfilling, all those things are good. 
But when you allow those things to take precedent and priority over the things of God, they become thorns. Your love for your spouse is a good thing, but don't let it become a thorn. Your love for your children is a good thing, but don't let it become a thorn. Don't, 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 don't allow those things to compete for the allegiance to Christ. Let me just say three things. Cares, riches, and self-gratification. See, we have cares. Let me give you another word for cares. Anxieties. Sometimes we worry a lot. Sometimes somebody said too much. Sometimes we worry too much. Jesus said, all your worrying can add one inch to your stature. All your worrying, you can't change your hair back to black. All your worrying, you know, all that grease and whatever. Actually, Michael Jordan, he cut his hair out, right? One time I was watching the game, right, the Lakers, and Kareem was sitting on the bench. And the, the commentator, he's still growing. He growing right through his hair. He was going bald, right? <laughs> In other words, there are certain things that you can't change to stop. Right. No need to worry about it. Right. Give it to God. Amen. God. God is concerned about the welfare of even the birds uh, and the lilies of the valley. Right. The birds in the air. Don't you think he may be concerned about you just a little bit? Right. We're worried about things we can't change. Yeah. Worried about things we can do nothing about. Yeah. Spend your first rate time on second rate stuff. Right. Someone said that tomorrow, I read it right now, tomorrow is the busiest day in the world. So much energy on tomorrow. Nothing being done today. Anxiety over the material. The love of money. The love of money. Oh, has, 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 has made many a, a good person go bad. Story about the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler. Uh, Jesus said, come and follow me. He said, I'll follow you. He said, you know, what, what do I lack? He said, you're good. You can do this and you know, you get a check. You know, okay, I got that. He said, go get all your possessions, go sell them, get away, and come follow me. He was still walking, he already goes for sex. Because this guy couldn't follow him. Because he was so attached. He was attached to his possessions. His possessions were attached to him. He possessed possessions, but then his possessions began to possess him. And he couldn't follow Jesus. As we move to an end on this, guard your heart. How do you guard your heart? The Bible says, whatsoever things are lovely and pure, of good report, think on these things. Let the things of God occupy your heart and mind. Because that's another kind of soil. I'm reminded of there was a guy by the name of Joshua. And they were at the fork in the road in the sojourn of the children of Israel. And Joshua was the new leader. Moses is dead. He challenged the people. He said, choose ye this day who you will serve. And he began to talk about the gods they served in Egypt. The gods they served even in the land they now do. He said, you have to make a decision. He said, but as for me and my house, we don't have to deliberate on this thing. We've already made a decision. The same decision that God wants you to make today. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. See, Jesus said it like this. Seek ye first the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. And then whatever thing you want, all of us to be added to Don't worry about it. Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't get caught up in the, in, in the mundane and trivial that you missed the real ticket. Yeah, right. Seek ye first the kingdom yeah. and his righteousness. Mm -hmm. God's got your back. Mm -hmm. He'll take care of all the rest. Because, as we look at it, we finish this parable, we find that there's some good soil. Some good soil. Oh. These are the hearers who listen patiently, who respond eagerly, and who patiently continue to the end. Can you continue to the end? See, when you are good soil, the seed finds its place, and the soil is rich, the soil is uh, uh, deep enough, the thorn is cleared out, you know, no rocks and no thorns and all those kind of things, and is able to uh, bring forth much.
much fruit. You see, watch this. He hears the word and he understands it. Does not allow Satan to take it away. When he encounters trials, like we all will encounter trials, when he encounters trials, however, because of the word, he endures and perseveres. He's not blinded by the deceitfulness of riches. He continues to be fruitful and faithful. You see, God's word will not pass away. God's word will not return void. It will accomplish its intended purpose. Now get this, feel me on this now, because if you uh, hear the word and don't respond, God says, mission accomplished, because his word has proved the quality of your heart. Whether you are a vessel of honor or dishonor, God is still glorified. Not only that, not only that, uh, but when we look at this, uh, the difference, he is a hero. He is different from the other three. His life is characterized by faithfulness and fruitfulness. See, one heart was just so hard, couldn't receive it. One heart received it, but was just too light and superficial. One received it, but had too much going on in his life. But this is the heart. This is the heart that God is looking for. One that will persevere and endure to the end. Amen. We don't want to look on the road and say, brother, sister, so-and-so used to be a member here. Used to be faithful. But now, you know those, those movies, somebody hits a lottery in 10 years, and where are they now? Somebody had a one-hit wonder, and they had, where are they now? Don't let that be you. His brother and sister, so-and-so, they came to Christ. Where are they now? We are warned. Jesus uses this parable to warn us. He warns against the folly of being shallow, the folly of being hard, the folly of being preoccupied with other things. And he encourages us to be the example of the fourth one, to be good soil, the kind of hero uh, that you are uh, results in your salvation. You see, because apart from the word, there's no salvation. Does that make sense? You can't just be saved uh, just walking down like Richard Pryor. I was walking down the street. And God just, you know, that was a good joke back in the day. It's the Word of God. The Word of God is able to accomplish His intended purpose. The Bible said the Word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword. The problem is, we got hearts, hearts that are not fighting. We have hearts that hear the Word. But then what we respond to it? We have hearts that say no when it's supposed to say yes. What kind of heart, what kind of soil are you today? I take confidence and solace in the fact that regardless of how your heart is, God can work on your heart. I'm going to leave you with this. There's a parable of a fig tree. And the man came to the fig tree expecting fruit. But there was nothing. And after a series of episodes, the man says, you know what? Somebody give, uh, give me an axe, a hatchet. I'm going to cut this tree down. It's, it, 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 it shouldn't be taking up all the resources, the minerals, and all that kind of stuff. Cut it down. And then his servant came and said, no, no, please, 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 don't cut it down. And you know what he said? He says, let me tend to it. See, notice what he said. He said, I'm going to fertilize it. I'm going to cut, you know, you know, till the soil and cultivate it and give it all the nutrients. Notice he didn't say nothing about the tree. He said, don't cut the tree down. I'm going to work on the soil. I'm going to work on the heart. See, God wants to work on your heart. And when he gets your heart, he got you. If he don't have you, it just means he has your heart. God wants your heart today. We you give it to you? God wants you. He wants you to be good soil. He don't want you to be thin, superficial, flaky. He don't want you to be so preoccupied with the words you can't give energy to God. No, no, no. He wants you to give your heart to Him. He said, when you give your heart to me, I will bless you. I will bless you. I will give you everything you need. Eternal life, even to glory. If you do that. And you know that you want to make a step. A step of faith. To say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Son of the living God, I want to give my life to you. 
I know you gave your life for me. Now I'm going to give my life to you. You can do that. By faith, knowing that Jesus, he died for you. That's the thing that goes away. Because I know my life. Because I lived it. You don't know what I've been through, but I do. I know I don't deserve. I don't deserve God's love. Amen. And I look at people who are just like me. But you see, God loves us in spite of us. And he's made provisions. That's why Jesus came in the first place. He came to give his life as a ransom for you. you don't ask me to explain it. I just accept it. I just accept it. He died, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead on the third day. Now you too, you too can have a resurrected life. By saying, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm willing to repent of my sin. I'm willing to change my life. I'm tired of being weak and superficial soil. I want to be good soil. I want to give my life to him. I want to repent, turn from my wicked ways, confessing him as Lord and being baptized in the water grave of baptism for the remission of sin. So I can receive the gift and the benefits of the Holy Spirit. Some of you guys need prayer. Sometimes to make a step like this, it's not an easy thing. We need to pray for you. And we want to do that. And even as I speak, their, their leaders are coming up right now. They're taking their positions that you need prayer. If you need prayer, that God gives you what you need to be good soil. We want to pray for you. If you're here and you want to give your life to Christ, want to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin, we want to facilitate that. If you've been away from the foe, you've been you've strayed away from the family, he said, I'm coming home. I've been a prodigal son. I want to come home. You can do that today. Amen. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've been doing. You can come home. You know, sometimes people get scared to come because, you know, folks start judging us. We'll squash all that right now. Jesus has a heaven and a hell. Amen. Not me. That's right. All of us are in need of the saving grace of God. Amen. All of us. Amen. The ground is equal and even at the foot of the cross. Right. So don't worry about what someone may say. You need to come to the Lord. Don't worry about all the gossip that may swirl around as a result of your decision. Jesus says, when you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He wants you to come. He wants you to need prayer. You ought to come. If you need forgiveness of sin, you ought to come. Amen. As the singers get prepared to begin to sing a song that's designed to help you, to encourage you, as you contemplate just what your position is, where you are, we invite you to come. We invite you to give your life to God. We invite you to come and receive prayer. Show me. See, receive prayer. You may need prayer for strength. You may have a loved one who lost their way and you need prayer for them. You may have sickness in your family, trouble financially, relationships are broken, life is in despair. Whatever, whatever, whatever you're going through in your life, bring it to God. He can fix it for you. All you need to do is come. Is there one today? Is there one today? And you know you want to give your life to God. You know you need to give your life to God. We invite you to come.